remind you of where we've been so far. We are in our series called On Purpose. Not many good things happen in life accidentally. Play-Doh, I think, and Post-it notes. That might be it. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. There's not many good things happen accidentally. We want to be people who live our lives on purpose. Where we've been, we've talked about what does God want from you? Any of you remember what he wants from you? Your whole life. He doesn't want a sliver of the pie chart. He's the pie plate. He wants your whole life, right? We talked last week, why are you alive? You exist to be loved by God. He loves you. He's crazy about you. If he has a fridge, your picture is on his fridge, right? Like God loves you. Does your life matter? Absolutely. Your life has earthly significance and eternal significance because you were made to last forever. And how do we find our purpose? We find it in getting to know God. So we have, we've taken two weeks to really lay the groundwork so far of the, the On Purpose series. And today we want to start with our first purpose. Why do you exist? Why are you here? My first purpose is our big idea. My first purpose is to worship God. It is our first and our highest command. You exist to worship God, to worship God and give him glory. Revelation 4.11, the verse I alluded to earlier, says, You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you what you pleased he created you because you give him pleasure he created all things you created what pleased you and he created you which tells me that you please him we please the lord one of my favorite movies is an old movie with lucille ball i don't know if it's henry fonda i don't remember who it is yours mine and ours yeah <laughs> What's his name? Henry Fonda. Man, he was a looker. I, uh, I loved, loved, loved the original movie. And one of my favorite parts in the movie, and I still quote this line to Lonnie quite often, um, <coughs> he's on a date with this kind of wild woman, isn't she? She's kind of a hippie, free love, kind of weird woman. And at one point, they're on a date, but his mind is distracted by thinking of Lucille Ball, because who wouldn't? She's just stunning too. And so this woman looks at him and she says, she says, you're not worshiping me. And sometimes I'll look at Lonnie when he's not worshiping me and I'll say, oh baby, you're not worshiping me. I wonder, I don't actually want his worship, but I do want his love and his adoration. You know, like we all, we all want that, don't we? I wonder if the Lord sometimes looks at us and says, you're not worshiping me. Look how amazing I am. And you're not worshiping me. I don't think he does it in that high-pitched, singy-songy voice that this actress did. But I wonder if sometimes the Lord looks down at us when we're in church and he says, Oh, I'm glad you're here, but you're not worshiping me. I wonder if he looks at you on Monday at noon, you know, or Tuesday morning, whatever, and looks at you and says, Hey, you're not worshiping me. Today we're talking about our first and our highest call, the command to worship God. That's the command, right? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we're going to get to that verse in a minute. That's the command. That's the imperative. But, man, like a child, I want to know why sometimes, don't you? I want to know why. Let me tell you why. Romans 12, 1, out of the Good News translation, it says, Because of God's great mercy to us. Come on, that's the why. Because of God's great mercy to us, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. This is true worship, to offer your whole selves up to God. What do we give a God who has everything? What do we give a guy, like you ever try and shop for a present for a guy who's got everything, and if they don't, they can just go buy it? Like literally nowadays, you could right now order an air fryer on your phone within 30 seconds on Amazon. It could be here tomorrow. You know, like what do you give a God who has everything? 
The only thing that God does not have unless you give it to him. Listen to this. I thought, this, what's it, what an interesting thought this week. He has everything. Scripture says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? He also owns the, the hills, you know? Like, he doesn't just own the cows. He owns the hills that the cows graze on. He, he created the sun, moon, and stars, the mountains, the seas. He owns it all. What does he not have? The only thing that he only has when you give it to him is your mind, your heart, your song, your strength. Mark 12, 30, it says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and all of your strength. These are the only things that you can give him that he doesn't already have. You can't give him the ocean. You can't give him the mountains. You can't give him a book. You can't. He owns it all. The only thing that is ours to give that he desires that only you can give is your attention. Focused attention on God. Expressing your affection to God. And using your abilities for God. This is kind of where we're going today. Let's start with prayer before we dig into the message. Lord Jesus, we are so glad that we've already had time in your presence. Lord, if we left here right now, it, it's good. It was good. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with your people, and I'm so thankful. Lord, I am so thankful for your word. And where we're going this morning, Lord, I, I do thank you for that, that kind of that revelation this week that these are the three things that you desire that we have to give you. You don't just possess them because you're God. You get them, you receive them when we, your children, offer them up to you. So, Lord, today open our hearts to receive from you, open our minds and our ears to understand and hear what your word says. Help me to not get in the way of anything that you want to do today. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Since worshiping God is our first and highest priority, how do we do it? Let's talk about these three things today. How do we do it? Worship is focusing my attention on God. It is focusing my attention on God. A lot of religions will think of worship as just emptying your mind. As just letting your mind go where I empty my mind. I'm just in that place. I'm that, um, you know, that, that monk-like sound that we would make in that position. A lot of religions view worship as that, just that peaceful emptying your mind. That's not worshiping our God. He does not want an empty-minded um sound from you. And I so often equate our love for God in the same way I equate our love for our spouse or our parents or our children. Because human relationship, especially that marriage relationship, is a physical picture of that union, that relationship we should have with our God. This idea of if if Lonnie and I are going to show love for each other, focused attention, where I'm not, I'm not sitting next to him on my phone all night long, and he's not sitting there on his phone all night long. And there are times, it's difficult, isn't it, hon? Sometimes it's hard to stop what we're doing because if you're like me, I'm a, I'm a taskmaster. Like, I am all about, I got to get things done. I got to get things done on a time frame. But, man, to just set it aside and to look at somebody and give them our focused attention, that's what God wants from us. God wants our focused attention because he gives you that same thing. God focuses on you all the time. Listen to what Psalm 139, 1 through 3. Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart. You know everything about me. Focused attention. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down, when I stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. Your Father is so focused on you. He wants that in his worship back, that we worship him with focus. Remember when, um, do you remember when you first started dating your spouse or when you first started dating your boyfriend or girlfriend? Remember that <sighs> waiting for someone to be the first one to say, I love you? Do any of you remember that? I remember that. I was thinking of that this week. It was after I threw myself at Lonnie for the first time and kissed him. And you're laughing because you know it's true. I threw myself at him. I'm like, 
those luscious lips I can't keep away. And I threw myself at him, and then I felt so bad. And it was such a good kiss that he said he loved me. I mean, it was like that was it. Like, that's a good kiss when a guy tells you they love you right after you kiss them, you know. Here's what the beauty in that was. I didn't have to wonder anymore. Like, I knew where he stood. He expressed his love to me. He said it. He, and he said it. He, took the, he made the first move in that way. Like, your father in heaven said he loved you first. Isn't that beautiful? I love that scripture reminds us. He reminds us that he, we love him because he first loved us. He made the first move. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I, um, Romans 8, 7, listen to what it says. Focusing on yourself is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God and ends up thinking more about self than God. We live in a self-centered culture. We're selfish people. Come on, you're selfish. You know, a happy Sunday, I just called you selfish. I'm selfish. We live in, I mean, we created a term called a selfie. We're selfish people, aren't we? And uh, the tendency is to, when we go to worship God, the tendency is to look inward so much when the whole point of worship is looking upward. Remember the arrows up and arrows out. The point of worship is that I am giving him my focus and my attention. And I do that because he loved me first. He made the first move. He said he loved us first. How do we shift? How do we make that shift, though? Anyone else recognize that you're a little me-focused? I recognize it. How do we move from me-focused to he-focused, where we are focusing on him? Romans 12, 2, what does it say? Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. Fix your attention on God. First, what do we do? We're going to establish some different habits, right? We're going to establish a daily focus time on God. Man, this uh, when you don't do this, you feel it. I feel it. When I get self-absorbed and looking inside and I, and I don't take that focus time with the Lord, I feel it. And I'm going to tell you my family's going to feel it. The people around me are going to feel it because I'm not reflecting the character of my God when I'm not taking focused time with him. First thing we're going to do is we're going to develop that focus daily time. This is super practical. Let's get really, y'all know I like, I'm a, I'm a practical gal. Listen to what Matthew 6, 6 says. And I want to read it in the message because it's so practical. It says, find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. There's three words we're going to pull out of here. Notice the first one is place. If you go to the Old Testament, in the Old Testament tabernacle worship system, Moses had a place called the tent of meeting. And Moses would go outside the camp a little ways, and he would meet with God. Later, God gives them the the temple where everyone can go and everyone, I say that loosely, can go and worship God. God gave them a place that they could worship. But scripture's talking here about a private place. What does it say? Find a quiet, secluded place. It can be a closet. It doesn't have to be a fancy room. It can be the end of your couch, which is my spot. It can be on your front porch, Kimberly, right? It can be in your car. It can be anywhere. But Scripture is telling us, it's admonishing us for a good reason. Find a quiet, secluded place. Quiet and secluded because our minds are easily distracted. My mind wanders so viciously to where I have to set limits. I have to have certain things like... I just know myself, and I know that I was joking with my friend Tina and her boyfriend Phil that are here visiting, um, how I had to put a block on my phone for Pinterest, because where my, now I still, I have Pinterest, and I allow myself like 20 minutes a day if I choose, but it can't start until 8 a.m., 
And I set that boundary on myself because if you can discipline yourself, no one else has to, right? So I put discipline because where I pray in the morning, where I read scripture is at the end of my couch and I am looking directly into my kitchen and dining room area. Well, I know that we're about to start a remodeling project, hopefully this winter, I don't know, but we're trying to rethink our kitchen and redesign our kitchen. And so what I would catch myself doing is I'd be sitting there reading and trying to pray, and I would look at the kitchen, and I'd say, oh, wow, I wonder what it would be like if my fridge had one of those cabinets that came all the way around it, and then you didn't see the side of the fridge. Wouldn't that be cool? Well, pick up my phone. I go to Pinterest, like, I wonder what that would look like. Do you see what I'm like? That's how easily, that's how self-centered I was and how easy my focus can shift. Please tell me I'm not the only one who does weirdo things like that. It's tough. And so I just recognized that my devotion time with Jesus, I did not want it to be about getting distracted and looking at Pinterest. And so I set a guardrail on my phone so that I wasn't distracted by that. So that's just my own shameful admitting something weird about myself. A couple other words we notice is he said, just be there as simply, man, as simply. No ceremony, no fancy words. God is not impressed by your fancy words, and he's not unimpressed by your simple words. Be there as simply as you can before God. Listen, he knows you anyways. You go in there and try and go King James on him. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and glory. Like, if you go King James on him, he spots a phony. He doesn't want your phony air. He just wants you to be there simply with him. Simply also doesn't mean that you have to. I know we all like the room, movie War Room. And if you've got a closet and you want to do it up, go for it. I don't. I don't have a closet that I can go in and put post-it notes everywhere. I, I'm a simple gal. And he wants us to come before him simply. What else he says? He says, as simply and honestly, be yourself. Yeah. Don't try and pray like somebody else. You know, don't try and think like somebody else. Uh, uh, Rick Warren, he says, you may end up looking constipated instead of consecrated. <laughs> When we try and force ourselves to look like someone else, to worship like someone else, man, he loves you. He died for you. Do you really think you can impress him with fancy words? So stop that. Let's just go before him as simply and as honestly as we can. There's a thec second thing that you can do to focus on God. Develop a constant, steady conversation with God. This is really practical. A steady conversation with God. It... Um, it might look like, man, that is a beautiful sunrise, Lord. That is a really beautiful sunrise. Lord, the, 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 when you see an ambulance driving by, uh, one simple thing is, Lord, whoever is in there, they need your help right now. That steady conversation with God, that it doesn't have to be, this is my quiet time. Because remember, the faulty idea is giving God a piece of our pie, that this is my 15, my first 15. This is the time I give to the Lord. This is the time I give to work. The problem with that is he wants it all. And if he wants it all, give it to him. Give it to him all the time. So wherever you're going, wherever you're walking, whatever you're doing, giving him your focused attention, your focused worship. And here's one of the major benefits of this. Listen to what it says. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace. Man, how many of you want a little bit of that peace today? You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. You will keep in perfect peace. So not only is worship focused attention on God, not emptying ourselves, but focusing ourselves, focused attention. Worship is expressing our affection to God. This is so simple, you guys. I love this simple message. Worshiping God is expressing our affection to God. Worship, man, when we think of worship, we think of a certain time of Sunday morning, right? At 10 o'clock, from 10 o'clock to 10.05, we're going to have a fast praise song. And then for the next two, it's going to be the slow worship songs. Your life is meant to be lived as a worship song to God, showing affection to God. I love this about our God. He loves us. David was a perfect example, perfect example of expressing his love to God. He did not just think affection, he showed affection. Man, I'm going to need you to check in on this one, because sometimes we think that worship is what girls do. 
right? We sometimes think worship is just what girls do, but man, we would be wrong because why? Big, strong, sword slinging, giant slaying men of God worship expressively. They worship out loud. Let me read you. This is a story in 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 16. And I wish that I could give you all the background and all the detail, but that is a sermon for another day. And I'll get there. I promise we'll preach that one someday. But here, David goes and he returns the ark of God. He returns it to its rightful owners, its rightful place. And here's what happens. The first time he does it wrong, and I won't get into the details, but he does it wrong, right? People die, it's bad. David actually gets mad at God because a dude named Uzzah dies. And he dies on his watch. David is mad at God, but he really knows in his heart he's mad at himself because it was his fault that blood was on his hands because he chose to disregard God's rules. So this time, dude, David does it right. David's a man of God. David, if anyone thought David was a weakling, a girly man, you'd be wrong. David killed, gi- David killed a giant. He killed wild animals. Like, David was a dude. He wasn't a sissy woman. And listen to what he does. And oh, he wasn't a sissy. Oh, no, not all women are sissies. I was like, what did I say wrong? I'm not a sissy woman. There are sissy women. David was not a sissy woman, okay? Y'all scared me for a minute. I thought I said something really horrendous, and it wouldn't have been the first, probably. Yeah. Oh, boy. It says, and David danced before the Lord. Listen to all the action words. Listen, it doesn't say David thought anything. Listen to what he does out loud expressively. David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of ram's horns. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, which was his wife, looked down from her window, and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. Uh, Just one point of uh, observation in there. Some people aren't going to like the way you worship. Some people are going to think you worship too loud. Some people might think you worship too demonstratively. Let them think what they want. You're not worshiping them, Right. right? Brent, some people might not like the song you sing. And you know what? You're not singing it for them anyways. So Brent has my permission. If anyone ever comes to him and says, dude, I don't like that song you sang, you can say, I wasn't singing it for you anyways. It's okay that you didn't like the song that I sang because I sang it to a different audience, an audience of one. What I, what I want to say is, men, it's time that some of you come out. I said that to get your attention to make sure you're awake. Let me, let me tell you, because like I said, sometimes we, think, some, sometimes we think that, well, that's just not the way I'm wired. I, and I've said this. I'm not a demonstrative, like, if you see me dancing up front, you better know that the Holy Spirit is touching me. Because I'm not a dancer, you know? If you see Kimberly dancing up front, it's just another day. But if you see me... <laughs> You know that something real is going on, and I've used that as an excuse. I've used, well, it's just the way I'm wired. I'm just not an expressive person. I've used that as an excuse to just be still. But David, listen to what he does. When I say it's time to come out, real men and women of God, they worship with outstretched hands. Reaching out to God. Real men and women of God worship with outspoken words. They didn't just think it, he sang it out to God. Real men and women of God worship with outward displays of affection. Out, it's time that we come out. Psalm 95, 6 says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Worship, man, expressive worship. I I just want you to know that sometimes... It is good to express our worship out loud to our spouse, isn't it? Like you can say, well, I said this a few weeks ago. Well, I told you I loved you 25 years ago, and if it changes, I'll let you know. Like, don't we want to hear that we're loved? 
Don't we want that expression, that outward, audible expression of love? Don't we want sometimes those outward displays of affection? Why would we think our loving God is any different? It's time to worship God. The last thought, worship is focusing my attention on God. It's expressing my attention to God, my affection, but it's also using my abilities for God. Super practical. Worship isn't just singing. It's not just saying I love you. Worship is super practical. It is how can I use my abilities? Because remember, you will worship the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. That's about my physical body, my abilities. How can I use the body, the abilities that God has given me and placed within me to glorify him, to worship him? It is nice. It is, so I said a second ago, it's good to express your love. It's nice to say I love you. Men, your wife wants to hear you say you love her, but sometimes she wants help folding the towels. Okay? Or matching the socks. Weirdos have baskets of mixed match socks. I don't know. All right. Women, listen, your man might need, he needs to hear that you love and respect him. But he also might want a good home-cooked meal every now and then, too. He might want chicken and dumplings. You know? Like, he, you see what I'm saying? Like, it is good to hear that you are loved. But sometimes an actual physical display of, I'm going to help you around the house, or, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you your favorite meal or I give you a, a beautiful something. You know what I'm saying? Like how can we worship God with our abilities where it's not just mouth service, where it's not just out loud, but it's out loud. It's expressing it to him with our bodies. Colossians 3.23 says work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord rather than people. Expressing the, to the Lord our worship and in, in working in, and practically speaking, let me tell you just quickly an example. When Before we got married, um, we worked, I worked at a wonderful church in Des Moines, Iowa, very large children's ministry. And that sixth grade year, we treated it as its own youth group. It was kind of the pre-youth group. So that every year we would have 50 to 60 sixth graders. And so my job is I worked with those sixth graders, and I got to invest my life in them for that entire sixth grade year. And the goal was to pour into them so that that black hole between children's ministry and youth ministry was closed up where I could transition them to youth ministry in a lovely way. So they got my attention. They got, they got my love for that year. And then I shipped them off to a youth pastor because at seventh grade, I didn't want them anymore. So seventh grade's hard. If you've been in seventh grade, you know it's hard stuff, right? So this, um, before we got married, they had a bridal shower. All the little girls in that sixth grade group wanted to have a bridal shower for me. And they called it um, Shower Around the Clock. And so these sixth grade girls all picked an hour of the day to give me a gift based on that hour. Now, the adult leaders took the nighttime, okay? But the the girls, the sixth grade girls, so one of them would draw like 6 o'clock. And so she got me a gift of something that I might use at 6 a.m., an iron skillet, a biscuit box, you know. Uh, Another girl got me a a gift of something that I may use at 5 p.m. when I'm making dinner, or one of them got, gave us a Scrabble game because she drew like 7 or 8 p.m. And she, what's, what's Pastor Amy going to do at night with this new husband? Surely she's going to play Scrabble, which we did. We, I still love Scrabble. And so they gave me a gift according to every hour of the day. And I wondered about that this week and I was preparing. I was thinking, Lord, can I give you a gift with my body, with worshiping you in a practical way? How can, how can I look at every hour of my day in that same framework? When you're working, man, Robin, when you're working with clients, then you're worshiping the Lord when you are showing his love to a client that you're working with at 9 a.m. in the morning, right? When you go and get your soda and piece of pizza at Casey's every morning almost, you know, you, you it's slowed down. When you go to Casey's, <laughs> hey, yeah, he looks good. It's slowed down, definitely. When you go to Casey's, you can worship, you can show your worship to the Lord at 6 a.m., at 7 a.m. When you are going and sharing the love of Jesus with somebody at that cashier booth, right? Like, how can you 
Worship around the clock. All day long, I'm showing you worship. When you're roofing on a roof buck with somebody, man, you can be showing the love of God. I don't know how, but you can. You know, it's, it's when we have such a close relationship with the Lord that we're thinking about him all the time. How can I worship around the clock? Worship team, would you come on up? I want to read you this uh, closing scripture. Romans 12, 1 out of the message. It says, take your everyday life. This is so good. Listen. Take a deep breath. I want you to listen. I want you to check in with me. I know it's getting late. We're almost done. But I want you to hear this verse because it's so powerful. Take your everyday life, your ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, your walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. That's worship around the clock. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, we can give God glory even in our sleep. How do we do that? Man, if I can go to bed with praise on my mind, I don't do it a lot. I need to do it. I'm not, like, I, I, don't be, I don't want to be hypocritical. How can we go to, go to bed with praise on our mind? By closing the day in prayer, I worship the Lord through prayer. You're sleeping. You're eating. Man, but even just a simple prayer before a meal. In a, you know, I've, I've, we've been in restaurants where we've prayed together at a meal and someone has walked by. They saw it. We didn't do it for them, but they saw it and they're like, I love that you prayed before your meal. Like, have you ever had that happen? Like, people are amazed at that, that we would take time. You're going to work and you're walking around life. And make that an offering to the Lord. Guys, can I just say, sometimes I think we make it harder than it has to be. I, I make lots of things in my life harder than it ever has to be. You know, if there's a project and there's a simple solution, most of us are going to go to the hardest solution. What if we learn to make it, make it not as hard as it has to be? Here's what 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, so make it our goal to please him. That, can it be that simple? Can worship be that simple? Make it your goal to please him. And you're waking up life. You're going to bed life, you're eating life, you're working life, you're walking around life. Make it your goal to please him. Would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? Lord, I thank you that I was made to worship you. I was made to worship you. I am a worshiper. It's not just what I do, it's who I am. I'm a worshiper. And you are worthy of that kind of life. You deserve. You're the God of creation. You deserve the praise that I give you. You deserve the worship from my heart. You deserve a life lived in worship to you. God, help us to do that. Help us to offer our lives to you as a worship every day. Help us to offer that to you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you an opportunity what can you give God that he doesn't have unless you give it your life? Because he is a good God, he does not force himself upon you. Because he's a good God, he invites you to be his child, invites you into relationship with him. And today he wants to invite you into relationship with him. And so if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Amy, I am not walking with Jesus. I'm not walking with him, but I want to walk with him. I want to do life with Jesus. I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. There's nobody looking around. Everyone's eyes are closed, your head's bowed. If that's you and you'd say, Pastor Amy, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior today. I'm ready. Would you raise your hand so we can pray with you? Is there anybody in the room? We want to pray with you. If that's you, we won't do anything to embarrass you or, or to call you out. We just want to pray with you right where you are. Is there anybody in the room? You're ready to make Jesus your Lord. church look this way normally we would close the service with a slow subdued song right that's the way I kind of you know I'd like today I just rocked your world or just changed it all up haven't I and I've said a few weird things in the in the process I ask our worship team to end with this song because we want to offer the Lord our praise and our worship. Church doesn't have to be the slow song. It can be worshiping the Lord with our hands, expressing ourselves. And so I'm going to encourage you and challenge you 
Remember David sang out, shouts even. He lifted his voice. Some of y'all don't sing out loud. I'm not going to name names, but I know some of you, I've never heard you sing. It's time that we sing out loud. Some of you, listen, this is even a big challenge. Some of you have never lifted your hands. Like there's no judgment in this. It's just observation. Some of you have never lifted your hands in worship. I do. Do you think I'm a weirdo? Oh, well. dang. That was the wrong question. Was that Desi or Mackenzie? Kylie. Let me ask you. Do you think I care? No. No. So here's the truth. If I worship the Lord and I'm expressive and emotive and I lift my hands, there's nothing weird about that. I'm worshiping the God of the universe. There's something, come on, there's something weird about those of you who don't worship the Lord, uh, the God of the universe. So I'm just going to challenge you as our worship team sings this. Could you today just try one new thing? Maybe it's clapping. Maybe it's singing out loud. Maybe it's lifting a hand, even like this. But you, could you just begin to express your worship to the Lord in a physical, demonstrative way? Are you ready, Brent? Yeah, I'll sing out loud for now. You're gonna, Brent's going to sing out loud. All right. I know I usually don't, All but right. I'll sing out loud. Lead us in worship. Close right. us out, brother. 